Hey, welcome to Wednesday night Bible study. Pastor Jim here inviting you to the table. Hopefully you're still up and around and going. I know this is uh, August. It's mowing, planting, harvesting, all things season. So um, I know lots of activities are going on. School's back in session. Uh, lots of things taking place, but I hope you're taking time for Bible study, either live or here, uh, pretty quick here in the future, you'll be able to watch that, so uh, anyway, we're super glad to have you join us this evening, uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 9, talking about Saul this evening, if you want to turn your Bibles there as we get started, get going, uh, again, if you would share this on your page, that would uh, help us to get that a uh, message out and about, and uh, for others to be able to take part in our Bible study, that's always a, a super thing for us. Um, it really helps with uh, the way things go. People are able to see it. Uh, people are able to share and take part in it. Uh, so with all those things this evening, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to go ahead and get that posted, and we'll go ahead and, and get started this evening. Uh, we do have a few announcements. Uh, we have a uh, food pantry tomorrow at Pomona for the West Franklin School District from 1 to 4. And there's also a delivery in the morning for those that help with that. So we'll be letting you know what time the truck shows up. Then on Tuesday, there'll be a food pantry at North Baptist. Uh, there's also a delivery next Tuesday at North. Uh, so we'll be sure and let everybody know what time that'll be there as well. Um, getting supplies in to be able to ship them back out. Uh, that's the great thing about it. And it's Sunday morning. We're always live at 1030 in person. Uh, we're live at 1035 on Facebook. Uh, we show the video that goes along with this Bible study. And then once that is done, we go ahead and uh, go live at that point. So uh, we invite you to join us in person. We invite you to join us uh, live this Sunday morning, uh, whatever that works for you. Uh, be sure to invite somebody. That's part of our August uh, challenge that you would uh, invite someone to church, not someone that goes somewhere else, but someone that might not go. Uh, invite them to either in-person church or Facebook Live with you. Uh, that would be great to have them come alongside us. So anyway, this evening, we're glad to have you. Uh, we're glad to be a part of your life this evening with what, uh, like I said, with the busy schedules of everything that's going on. But we uh, truly appreciate you coming alongside us. Uh, we do have several prayer concerns this evening. I uh, want to continue to lift those up. Uh, my wife's cousin Ryan uh, just had surgery, uh, praying for his recovery. Uh, my nephew's husband Charles just had surgery as well. Uh, they almost had the same surgery in different uh, parts of the state here. But uh, And then he's uh, praying for his recovery as well. Uh, things seem to be going uh, fairly well after major surgery in both these guys' lives, so we just continue to pray that God would, would touch and, and be a part of their healing. Uh, continue to pray for Cora and her recovery. Uh, she also had a friend that had been in a car wreck recently, uh, praying for um, healing and recovery for her as well. Uh, Bill, we mentioned on Sunday, uh, had some issues with some hearing. He had a doctor's appointment and uh, got a Fairly good report. They're going to work on some things, so we, we pray that that all goes forward and well for him uh, with his hearing. And Then Don and Pat uh, have an unspoken. Also, some upcoming surgery there. I want to remember them in prayer. Um, Janice has an unspoken prayer this evening. Uh, Tony and Michelle to continue to pray for uh, just health and healing for them. Uh, baby Crew, Baby Asher, Baby Scarlet continue to pray for them. We also mentioned that uh, Asher has a surgery on the 19th, which will be for a feeding tube. We want to really lift him up and uh, pray and pray that he recovers, bounces back from that real quick, and is up uh, going. Uh, Prayer for Marge. Uh, she's been having some issues with some health, and uh, we ran her through our prayer chain, but we want to continue to remember her. Uh, Barbara, which is Greg's sister. Um, I have an unspoken. We ask you to continue to pray for that. Uh, Wayne Smith and then John, both... Uh, Gentlemen from Michigan uh, have cancer, praying for them. Uh, Jessica from West Virginia, praying for health for, for her. Uh, also praying for uh, Keith, uh, had an aunt that passed away uh, recently. He 
traveled and has, is back, but he's pretty road weary from the travels, uh, be with the family and, and just uh, help each one as they uh, process this loss of the aunt. Uh, Belinda as well, her and Wes traveled uh, back and forth for a, a funeral as well. And then I don't know about where you're at, but uh, school has started here and is back in session. So pray for the administration, pray for the teachers, pray for the kids, uh, pray for safety as they uh, travel to and home. And uh, there'll be a lot more kids on the on the streets headed home before and after school. And and uh, uh, that's not always been the case for the last several months. So just make sure all the drivers are alert and attentive and, and watching for these youngsters and uh, just pray that they have a, a blessed school year this year and uh, are able to uh, gain uh, insight and, and knowledge uh, from that. And so those are our prayer concerns this evening. If you'll uh, join me in prayer, we're going to go ahead and kind of uh, get started as we go here this evening. You know, Lord, we are so thankful for your presence with us. We thank you that uh, uh, you... You guide and direct, Lord. You you care about uh, the big things in our lives as well as those small little details. And, and Lord, for for some, we've seen this week has um, brought on some some major surgery. Uh, some have lost loved ones, uh, Lord. Some have uh, uh, like course friend has even been in in car accidents and. Uh, are trying to come bounce back from that as well and and so this evening Lord we just pray for uh, each one that we had mentioned uh, Lord that you would uh, touch and encourage and strengthen in a in a way that only you can uh, Lord we know that you are the great physician uh, we know uh, our desire for each one of these individuals is to be healed and recovered and back up and going and and uh, Lord sometimes that really takes uh, what we call a miracle. Uh, for you, it's just something that is an everyday occurrence. Uh, Lord, sometimes it takes a, a process uh, to go through recovery. And so, Lord, I pray that you administer to each one in the way that uh, needs to be. So, Lord, we thank you this evening uh, in advance for what you can do in these lives. And, Lord, I pray that you would allow us to, to see it. Uh, as you touch these individuals, Lord, uh, uh, let them feel and understand and know your your presence is with them and uh, lord uh, scripture says i can do all things through christ who strengthens me uh, so uh, lord we know that it's through you uh, that we find hope and help and and uh, solutions uh, even recovery so lord we give this things to you this evening we thank you in in jesus name amen Hey, we did send a prayer chain through for some of you ladies if you are interested. Um, there's a women's conference at, at First Southern Baptist in Topeka, October 7th and 8th. Uh, cost is $20. Uh, the ladies will drive up and back to Topeka on Friday night and then up and back on Saturday. Uh, if you're interested in going to that, uh, be sure and let uh, Shelly or Jessica know uh, pretty quick here so we can get you signed up for that. <clears throat> there's also one in Salina. Uh, which is much quicker. It's in September, and the sign-up date for that is uh, really drawing really near. Uh, if you're interested in going to something a little more in, in advanced, uh, where you would spend the night, uh, be sure to let uh, Shelly or Jessica know as well. We're going to uh, offer an appeal to any of the ladies on Sunday morning at church that if they want to go, we need to know uh, that day for that one in Salina. Uh, we need to know fairly soon for the one in Topeka, um, but it's really a great opportunity uh, to be able to be a part of, of uh, the ladies at, at North and, and the Lighthouse together and and uh, being a part of what's going on there and then uh, sharing with some great insight and teachings and worship uh, from some of the ladies around. And so we really encourage you to uh, be a part of that. Anyway, let Shelly or Jessica know. You can message them, um, text, call, email, um, knock on their door, whatever it takes to, to let them know. So uh, we'd encourage you to do that as well. Um, also this evening is my, well not this evening, the whole day today is my wife Shelly's birthday. And uh, so we've kind of, uh, not that a whole lot, she's been pretty busy, I've been pretty busy, but uh, we're going to sing happy birthday to her uh, this evening. 
And so if you'll join me in singing Happy Birthday, and uh, uh, we'll kind of encourage you that way. So, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. We won't tell what number it is, dear Shelly. Happy birthday to you. All right. Uh, exciting, right? Embarrassed, probably. Um, especially with that super singing. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, really want to encourage her today. Uh, she's been a big part and help in, in, uh, in my life and my ministry and, and what a blessing she's been. So uh, anyway, if you've got your Bibles this evening, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to be in um, Acts chapter 9, talking about Saul being saved. Uh, one of the things I wanted to show you this evening, uh, we just have... Uh, Tonight's and then three more lessons in this gospel foundation. Uh, we're going to work towards some different um, Bible studies after this. Uh, and so uh, the material is on the way in. It's called Gospel Shaped. I do have one of the books. To see. It's called Gospel Shaped Worship. There's Gospel Shaped Living. There's Gospel Shaped Evangelism. There's Gospel Shaped Mercy. Uh, one more, I can't remember what it is, it eludes me at this point, but uh, each book's about seven to nine sessions, and so we're going to uh, begin this and carry through this now. It'll really be a, a great uh, follow-up to what we're doing with the foundation, uh, these things here. And so these will help us now put into practice and put into play the things that we've been learning uh, through the discipleship pathways, through gospel foundations. Uh, we don't have as many of these books. Uh, there's quite a few of them around. Uh, if you're able to get some, uh, I will post on here what ones we're looking at. And uh, if you're able to get yours, that would be great. We do have some. We have some at the church as well. Uh, so let me know if you need some. Uh, again, with this Bible study, it'll be the same way. You don't have to have the book to follow along in our Bible study. I really hope and pray that you continue to follow along with us as the Gospel Foundation ends. We start to do a, a gospel-shaped uh, life and living and worship and, and, uh, and mercy and evangelism and, and through those different uh, teachings and trainings as well. Uh, continue to invite others. We've got that August challenge out there for you to be a part of each one of the Bible studies, to attend church, whether it's Facebook Live or in person uh, each Sunday in August to uh, try not to watch uh, TV or Facebook videos or TikTok or any of that stuff unless it's Christian based. Uh, try not to uh, read anything unless it's your Bible or Christian books for the month of August. And in that, I think you'll really, if you started that even today on the 17th, I think you'd really be... Uh, surprised uh, what the outcome of this month would be for you. And then also the last thing on that uh, challenge is for you to uh, invite someone to church, whether it's on Facebook Live or whether it's in person. And uh, the catch is uh, we're not looking to invite people from other churches to come to church. We're inviting someone who doesn't go to church to church. And that might mean going and picking them up and bringing them with you. That might mean uh, calling them on the phone uh, Sunday morning or Wednesday night before Bible study or before worship service and saying, hey, would you be willing to uh, join me in, in uh, Facebook Live tonight, you know, uh, th this morning, uh, whatever it might be. We encourage you to do those. I'll post that picture back up on the, uh, the Facebook page again. Uh, it's a great way to kind of challenge yourself to be uh, what God has really called you to be and who he wants you to be. And it's kind of a great way to kind of step outside the, the walls of the church uh, and be uh, Christ in the community. That's what we've talked about for the last two years, really, uh, on the Bible study here. So um, John Privet uh, told me about a really good movie last night. I, I, uh, Shelly and I watched it. It was really good. It's called In His Steps. In His Steps. Uh, Charles Sheldon wrote a book years ago uh, entitled The Same Thing. It's a movie off of that book. Uh, if you read the book, maybe. Um, there's an older version 
um, probably 60s, uh, early 60s, and then there's a, a recent one, uh, 2012, and so we watched the one that was from like 2012 or 2013, I can't remember what it was. Uh, really, really a good movie. I had to thank John for uh, <coughs> letting me see that, bless you, uh, for uh, inviting us to, to watch that. Uh, it's on... It's on uh, YouTube, it's on uh, Prime Video, it's on several of those things that you're able to, to watch, probably, if you have any connection with any of those. And uh, it, uh, it's really good, and it's really neat, because it really talks about kind of where we are as a church, and how we're doing things, and where we're going, and uh, lo and behold, there's a movie about it, right? So, uh, it, it was really good, we watched it, watched it last night. And we stayed with our... Uh, you know, watching the Christian type based uh, TV, so that's where we were at. Anyway, this evening we're going to be in Acts chapter 9. Uh, we're glad you joined us. Be sure and share this on your Facebook page so others can uh, come alongside us and, and be a part of the Bible study as well. Um, Acts chapter 9 is about Saul's conversion. Uh, we've been following through. It, it's amazing that we have. We began this almost a, a year ago now in Genesis, and here we are in Acts chapter 9. We only have, uh, after tonight, three sessions left in this, and we'll be in Revelation. Uh, so I hope you've really gleaned and, and gained a lot from it. Uh, just as Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt, uh, God used what looked bad and was for his glory and turned out good. Uh, Joseph was able to rise into uh, power in Egypt, and when his uh, father and brothers were, uh, were facing a famine, uh, he was able to provide food for them and provide safety for them. Uh, well, God took the death of Stephen, which was bad, and turned it for good as well. Um, the Jewish officials put and stoned Stephen to death because of his allegiance to Jesus, uh, because of his bold proclamation of, of God's word and not willing to stand down or step down from that. Uh, they, they stoned him. Uh, they were trying to stop the Christian movement, the, the thing called the way. And so their violence at that point scattered the church. Uh, we looked at last week Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip was one of the deacons that uh, traveled and went on to Samaria. Uh, from Samaria, he uh, heard God's call to come down to uh, the desert road on the way to Gaza. Uh, he met the Ethiopian eunuch. God intertwined those two uh, men at that point. He shared Jesus uh, with him through the scriptures of Isaiah. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch accepted Jesus, was baptized, and then God transferred Philip on up, uh, preaching all the way clear up to Caesarea from that point. And so there's an interesting concept here as we look at those things. Um, our perspective of suffering really should change when we consider God's broader plan of, of redemption. Uh, none of us want to suffer, none of us want to be a part of anything like that, but we also know that in the midst of that, um, Jesus said that if you follow me, uh, that means following him in a life where he was persecuted, he did suffer, and as those things took place, it, uh, Jesus said that it will take place in, in our lives as well. The greatest thing about it for us is that we have hope of eternity, we have hope of security, and we have hope of uh, guidance and direction in the midst of his deliverance for us, his guidance through this suffering. And God never does things wrong. And so even at times when we think, man, this is impossible, you know, this, uh, 
how did God, and God doesn't know this is taking place. God knows exactly what's taking place. And, and if we allow it, uh, like Joseph, if we allow it, like the early church, he can use any bad for his good if, if we allow him. Now, that's not to say if we are constantly complaining, griping, uh, everything about uh, what's going on in our lives, then it's not going to turn out the way God really wants. That means really submitting our will and our way to him. So that's what uh, God is, is wanting. That's what he's wanting to see from us. And so that's where we're headed this evening with this, with this message. And so the gospel was on the move. Um, persecution continued and really uh, amplified. It, it, it grew uh, even more even after Stephen's death. And one of the main uh, people with this persecution was Saul. Uh, he was a Pharisee. He was uh, one in leadership. He was bent on destroying uh, the way, uh, all the Christ followers. Uh, he believed that everyone who followed uh, Jesus, uh, that was really blasphemy. That was not what it was uh, supposed to be. Uh, they were supposed to be like him, uh, who was a Jew. And so he, he was never ending on arresting, uh, bringing in men, women, and children, uh, anyone who would uh, say that they were following Jesus. Uh, he had, had them in prison. They were, they were beaten. They were tortured. They were, they were suffering through it. Uh, some were killed, and all of that because they were following Jesus. And so here again, we see God's unexpected work in the midst of what seems to be a, a critical point in the life of the church. A very um, sad thing, maybe even going on. And in the midst of that, God's grace was going to take hold with whatever was taking place. And Saul was going to be a key player in what God was, was doing. And so it's interesting that um, as Philip went to Samaria, he saw every one of those in Samaria as an opportunity to be able to minister Christ to Saul was just the opposite. He thought everyone who spoke of uh, the truth through Christ as the enemy. And so it was going to be a great uh, uh, transfer of, uh, or transformation here in Saul's life. And so we need to be careful as we look uh, to those around us. Are there people that we think... Um, are too bad, too far gone, no way God's grace could get to them. Uh, we've got to be careful that we don't alienate somebody that God can use in a major way. Uh, a lot of times we think about um, those that are homeless, those that, uh, drugs and alcohol, those that are on the street, those that, um, are in prison, those that, you know, and the list just goes on and on and on and on and on. And, uh, and so we've got to be careful that we don't uh, segregate people into those classes because we see here throughout Scripture that God can and will use anyone that will turn to him. And in Saul's life even, we see uh, grace can happen through anybody's life as long as they turn to him. And so the Bible first introduces Saul at the stoning of Stephen. Um, Saul was really just a bystander. He was not one of the major uh, players. He wasn't really throwing the stones. But the scripture says that he, he stood by holding the cloaks of those that, that did. And so he was a part of, of what was going on. Uh, Saul was a Roman citizen. Uh, he was born in what we would call today modern-day Turkey. Uh, he was brought up in a really ritualistic uh, Jewish family. His his family was both uh, his mother and father were really uh, strict uh, Jews who did not 
uh, really like Gentiles or Samaritans at all. And so he kind of was brought up in this uh, legalistic type family, <coughs> and that uh, really encouraged uh, where he was as an individual now that these things were taking place. Saul was zealous for what he saw as his God and the direction God was going and what God wanted him to do in his life. Um, he held all others to the same standard that he was at, and if they didn't uh, come alongside the standard he was at, then they were not going the right direction. Uh, so uh, he refused to associate with anyone uh, that he would see as unclean. So as Saul refused to associate with these Gentiles, uh, it's interesting that uh, Saul viewed uh, God's love and his uh, God's kingdom was for him, his, his Jewish nation only. Uh, they were not the ones that were supposed to take the message to the world. It was just about them in the world. And so later we're going to see that really changes because Saul becomes uh, the instrument that would take the good news of Jesus Christ to the whole Gentile world. And here we are still talking about him uh, tonight, 2,000 years later. And so as a young man, Saul lived in Jerusalem. Uh, he, he learned from uh, Gabriel. Uh, his education would have been uh, far beyond uh, what most uh, normal men of that time would have been. Uh, he, he knew Jewish history, uh, the Psalms, the prophets, uh, all those things uh, better than, than some of the teachers even did at that time. Uh, he saw, again, he saw Christianity as, as blasphemy. Uh, the idea that God would come as a man... Uh, in his mind, um, made Yahweh, uh, God, not even holy because that would bring him into the presence of a sinful people. And it was so severe that, that uh, because of that, then blasphemy was, was punishable by death. And that's what we saw with Stephen a couple weeks ago. But God had a different future in mind for Saul. And... Uh, uh, that's where he does change his name later. Uh, his Greek name of Saul would be Paul, and so that's why he changed. It was changed to to Paul at that point. And so, so God's desire is for everyone to come to repentance, to come to salvation, and then to not be uh, separated from Him eternally. Uh, and God will do everything he can in his power except force an individual to make a decision for him. Other than that, God will do almost anything uh, in, in biblical precedent to uh, bring someone to, to salvation. Uh, he'll work through, use things in our lives, circumstances, people... Uh, he'll touch us in different ways, all kinds of things to get us to make a decision, but he will never force us to make that decision. We still have to make that decision uh, for repentance and then to call on him on our own. And so the conversion and the calling of Saul uh, demonstrates God's power to save. Uh, we start by uh, really explaining and, and, and diving into seeing the seriousness of, of Saul's relationship, he thought, with his God and the seriousness of what he was doing um, until it comes to the encounter uh, with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And so this man who had the hardest heart towards Christianity turned to become the most valuable missionary in the early church time. And we see then that it's only the, the gospel, it's only the truth about Jesus that can transform. And so we have it in his word, and we should have it in our lives, that it's what brings transformation is the truth of Jesus in our lives. 
And so that's what uh, brings salvation. It's what brings transformation. And so it's interesting for each one of us, then what, what, do you, what would you think would be the biggest thing that, I'm not sure what I'm saying, that, that stands out to you, that speaks to you about the conversion of Saul? And as I thought about that, for me, it was really uh, the extremes that God will go to to reach us. He has created us. He, he does love us. Uh, he, not, he doesn't just say that he loves us, but he expresses that love. And he expresses that love in such a way that uh, he will do those things to reach us. There was a lot of people with Saul at that point in his encounter with Jesus. But it was Saul who really made the decision and the choice to follow Jesus. In all actuality, there might have been several in that group that as Saul, they saw Saul's strength then come from the Lord, uh, his sight came from the Lord, uh, those things took place. Uh, scripture doesn't tell us how many of those other men might have accepted and followed the way just by the decision that Saul made in himself. And so we're going to begin this evening by reading Acts chapter 9, 3 through 9. Acts 9, 3 through 9. And the scripture says, as he, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what to do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They, they heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand to Damascus, and for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. It's really interesting that Saul's perspective, his vision, was one thing. Uh, Christianity was false. He was going to single-handedly almost knock it out and, and take care of it. And on the way to Damascus, he encounters the risen Lord, Jesus Christ, and really what Jesus is saying is what you see is wrong. And you need to see it my way, and, and to do that, you're not going to be able to see at all. And so we went for three days without any sign. And, and never does it really say in the scriptures that uh, Jesus said, if you do this, do this, do this, then you'll regain your sight. Uh, that didn't take place. He just said, you go, and I'll tell you what, what to do. And so given the background then for Saul, uh, well, who knows what he was thinking during those three days of, of blindness. Uh, he fasted. He, he, he would have prayed. And I'm sure one of the questions that uh, came up multiple times, probably an hour, every hour, every day of those three days, was, is this Jesus real? And if so, Saul was probably thinking, what's going to happen to me? If this Jesus is real, look what I have done that's got me to this place, and if this Jesus is real, everything I did was wrong, and that means that this Jesus could be coming for me. Now, Jesus was coming for him, but not for what Saul could have thought, because he had the purpose and a plan for him. And the great thing about grace is that when we turn to Jesus in repentance, 
all of those things that we have done before, like on a chalkboard, whiteboard, whatever it is, uh, he erases. No matter what Saul had done, no matter what he'd been a part of, no matter how hard his heart was, no matter how many people he had affected, grace says, I can cleanse that. And so Jesus didn't ask Saul why he was persecuting the church. That's what he was doing. He asked Saul why he was persecuting me. Not Pastor Kim, but, but Jesus. That's who, that's who he was asking. Why are you persecuting Jesus personally? Now that's not because Jesus doesn't care for the church. That's because he identifies with the followers of the church. He identifies with the followers, his followers of Christ. And if you're doing that to them, you're doing that to, to me. And so Jesus reveals himself to Saul. He gives him instructions, which Saul gets up, we saw in the scripture, and, and follows the instructions that he was given. Boy, if we can learn one thing, and one thing only from Saul, I think that's what we need to learn. When he says something to us through his word or through circumstances or through situations, we just need to do it. We don't need to question it. We don't need to have a committee meeting about how many times this has to happen before it can be real. When Jesus says, then we are to do. And that's what Saul did. And he did it immediately. And so he, he was led on into Damascus. He, he fasted. He prayed. He had, he had blindness. And those things were not punishments for what he had done or what he had said or what he had been a part of, but rather it was to get him to stop, regroup, rethink, refocus, and then replant that vision in him of it's not about persecuting the church, it's about growing the church. And just as he was blind spiritually because he couldn't see, Jesus struck him blind physically. But God was going to live both forms of those blindness, and that's what we're going to see. So Acts chapter 9, 10 through 16. 10 through 16. So in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. So we got another guy here in this story. Uh, we kind of talked about this on Sunday, Ananias. How do you think Ananias felt when he was instructed to go take care of Saul? Go take care of the great persecutor of the church. Go take care of the one who has arrest warrants for Christians, arrest warrants for those in the way. You can hear from his voice. He was scared. He was unsure. He was trying to make sure that this was really what God wanted him to do. I'll, I'll do this, Lord. But it was almost like, this is a crazy response. 
And so God's plan for Saul was to reveal his purpose and his plan and his power in Saul's life. And see, that's what he wants to do to each one of us. But it's going to take us stopping, repenting, refocusing, replanting our vision to Jesus' way, not, not our way. And it's interesting because at that point in Saul's life, and it can be in your life as well, God does things that only God can do. And so that's what we see, is that as a human being, we can do a lot of things. Uh, the younger we are, the more physical we are. The older we get, the harder it is to do things. Amen? Amen. All right. But God works in only ways that, that he can work. Sometimes it's not even in the way that we think it's going to take place. And we've saw that uh, repeatedly since these last several uh, weeks in this in this Bible study. And he does things the way he can do it to accomplish what he wants done. And sometimes we don't think big enough in God's kingdom. We keep it kind of small. We keep him in a box. We keep him inside our church walls. We keep him in our homes. We don't take him outside. We don't, you know, we don't do those things. And really, in reality, that's what God wants. And so Ananias' response was really, here I am, Lord. And it revealed a, a heart that, that wants to please the Lord and, and obey him. And that's where we need to get as well. We need to get to a point of wanting to please God with our decisions and please God with our obedience. We never know what God is going to do as he works through us. You never know who you are going to speak to, come in contact with, and then what that individual is going to do with what God can do through them. Where most Christians would have looked at Saul with, with fear and turned the other way and really denied the thought that God called me to go speak to Saul. That's, I can't do that. But God told Ananias that Saul was a, was a chosen instrument and he was going to take this message to the Gentiles, to kings, and even to his own people, which would be the, the Jewish nation. And, and Saul, Paul, did just just what God said. And so this guy who really had the hardest heart possible is now sharing Jesus with everyone. He goes in to synagogues, starts with the Jews, he goes out to the corners, talks to the Gentiles, and then even appeals and wants to talk to the kings. So God uses those things. And so let's continue on in Acts chapter 9, 17 through 20. Our last set of scriptures this evening, 17 to 20. So then Ananias went to the house and entered it. He placed his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, the scripture says, immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. Okay, he got up. He wanted to identify with Jesus. He once was lost, but now he's found. He once was the greatest persecutor of the church, and now he wants to identify completely with Jesus because he believes. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, now, God could have healed Saul's blindness without Ananias ever going to him. But God never intends on anyone living the gospel on their own. 
We're not to live in our little boxes. We're not to live without fellowship from the church, which is God's people. No, it's not a facility. It's people just like you and me. But we're connected because of Jesus Christ, and we, we need interactions from one another to grow in our relationship. We need encouragement from Bible studies. We need encouragement from worship services where we, we sing and are a part of what's going on. We, uh, we, we receive encouragement when we serve at, at food pantries or serve day or uh, going out knocking on doors telling people about Jesus. Is that difficult? Yeah, on our own, any of those things are difficult. But like I said earlier, Philippians 4.13 said, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. So if we're going in our own power, if we're going in our own name, then it's difficult. But if we're going in and for Jesus, that's what makes the difference. And for Saul, that's what made the difference. So yes, he could have healed him without going there. He could have healed him without sending somebody there. But this shows us that we need one another. God has created us for that purpose. When Ananias addressed Saul, he didn't say, Hey, you persecutor. He said, Brother Saul. He knew in advance that Saul had and was going to be a vital part of what God was doing. He was affirming Saul's new relationship with the church. Ananias was a leader in the church in Damascus. He was a leader in Damascus. And when he came over and then affirmed Saul in that way, it eased the minds of some of the other people. He no longer is a persecutor of the faith. Now he's a part of the family of God, right? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Yeah, that's what, that's what Saul was. And so then afterwards, he was, he was baptized. He did not want to proclaim the one that he had not identified with. That's, that's key right there. He was going to be proclaiming Christ, and he had to identify with him through baptism to proclaim that to the world. Saul didn't know everything that was going to take place. He didn't know everything that was going to happen. He didn't know what it even meant, really, to follow Christ, other than this is what he was going to do. He knew enough to begin sharing the gospel. And he shared the gospel with those around him. Now, always, as we get to this point in our, our study each Wednesday night, we'll give you a chance to, to write down, and I want you to write down this evening, uh, whether it's in your Bible study book, in your Bible, in a piece of scratch paper, uh, text it to yourself, uh, do a voice command note, whatever it is. One way that you're going to apply this truth tonight as one whose heart was hardened but is now enlightened because of Jesus. What are you going to do differently? Let's just say before Bible study this evening or whenever you watch this, your heart was hardened. Hey, Pastor, my heart wasn't hardened. Well, let's just say it was. And now that you've been enlightened to the things as we come through these scriptures, what are you going to do differently? How are you going to do it differently? Like Saul, you may not know everything. You may not know exactly how it's going to transpire. But how are you going to move forward? How are you going to move forward with it? See, that's what, that's what makes a difference. Saul is an example for us. He was here. Now he's here. But he didn't just stop because, oh man, I got salvation. I can just sit in the, I can sit in the pew and sing songs and live the rest of my life. No. He, he was to go. He was to share the good news of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ with all of those he came in contact with. The, the first to his own... Uh, which would be the Jewish nation, uh, then to the Gentile world, and then to, to kings all around. And that's what he was to do. So beginning in this study this evening, we saw that, that Saul was disturbed. Uh, and he was frustrated because of all of these uh, Christians and what they were doing. 
All because of this Jew named Jesus. The one they said had been resurrected from the dead. It was crazy to think that that could even take place. And yet now there's a whole movement of people following that thought. And so for Saul, he thought, you know, this, this thought about this resurrected Jesus has, has got to stop. And so Saul was going to take care of it. He was the one that was going to do it. And so he set out with his uh, group of guys, whoever they were, to, to hunt down. He was basically a, a bounty hunter for Christians, right? He was going to persecute them. He was going to cleanse the world of these Christians. And he was going to do it as a one-man band with his little group that followed him. Anybody that aligned themselves with Jesus, he was going to take care of. So then Stephen's death uh, drove those who followed Jesus outside of Jerusalem, out into outlying areas. It scattered them throughout the region. Some of those places they went was, or one of those places they went was Damascus. It would have been one of the closest, just a, a few days travel away. Some of Jesus' disciples had scattered there. Saul saw it as a nearby destination that he could go and get some people and bring them back to Jerusalem. He was going to eradicate this way, right? And so his fury turned from not only Jerusalem, where Saul was at, but now it had turned towards Damascus. As Saul approaches Damascus, he's, man, you can just see it running through his mind. He's thinking how I'm going to, I'm going to capture all these Christians. I'm going to drag them back. We're going to have a big old party for all those uh, getting rid of the way people. And, and, and I'm sure this is all what's going through Saul's mind. He's going to eliminate Christ in the city of Damascus. He was going to capture him that next day. But instead, on the road to Damascus... Saul was the one that was captivated. And his capture began in the form of a, of a bright light. And that question, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He, Saul would have struggled with that question. He, he would not have recognized the voice because he did not know of Jesus. Now he might have Saw him in passing, he could have been even around when Jesus was still alive. But he didn't know Jesus. But Saul knew that this was some type of, of divine message that was coming to him. He was a good Jew. He'd read the scriptures. He knew that there were signs from God and things that would take place and God could do things like this. And so... He wasn't sure what it was, but he knew it was a message coming. And so why would a message from God come to say, why are you persecuting me? You know, in, in the first thought, he would have thought, Lord, I'm trying to eradicate these people that are blaspheming you. He wasn't persecuting God. He was trying to get rid of the ones that were. But with all those thoughts that run through our minds, and probably did his as well, he, he, those were not even things that he said. He says, who are you, Lord? Who, who are you that's talking to me? I mean, uh, not like he's big bad Saul at this point. He, he's down on his knees. He's, uh, he's scared to death, and he's asking, who are you? And so then Jesus identifies himself as the one being persecuted. As Saul persecuted his followers, Jesus' followers, he was persecuting Jesus. And so what Saul was doing to these people, he was actually doing to Jesus. And so all these things have to be running through his mind at this point. Uh, 
Oh my. Right? Oh my. The world as Paul knew it was about, or Saul was about to change. And the world as we know it begins with transformation. And so in our lives, it also has to begin with transformation. Transformation in our hearts and in our minds and then the directions that to the direction that God wants us to go. That's what I said a while ago. We have to put off what we think we know and allow God to work through us. We have to stop being hard-hearted towards other people, other nations, other cultures, other tribes, other tongues, and let God work through us. See, that transformation has to start individually in us. Now remember, he had, he had arrest warrants. He had marching warrants from the chief priest. But those warrants, those documents were about to be ripped up by the high priest. And Jesus said, go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. Sounds simple, right? The only thing is, he can't see. His eyes were open, but he could see nothing. How am I going to get to Damascus if I don't even know what direction it is? I'm assuming that I went down and I stood up, and it's probably this way. But if I stood up a little bit this way, I would think it's... So he didn't know. And it's interesting that back in Matthew 23, Jesus called the Jewish leaders blind guides. Very fitting for where we are, isn't it? So here's the thing. If you've been churched your whole life, it's easy to be convinced that your religious ways are what God wants you to be doing. Instead, you can actually be opposing his purposes in your very own life. So, so Jesus doesn't confront us to religious obedience. He confronts us to allow the Holy Spirit to move and work in our lives. Saul had religious things going on before all this took place, only it was the wrong religious stuff. And so Saul shows us how our hearts need to be transformed, leading into a thought of loving and genuine obedience to the Lord. So Jesus' encounter with Saul shows us that he can soften even the hardest heart, and he can transform even a mildly hard heart. And so again, we need to be careful not alienating anyone, whether they're from a different religion, country, political view, or, or whatever. Because the scripture of Peter says that God's desire is for all to come to repentance, not just a certain group or a certain type of people. And we can be blind towards our own religious beliefs thinking that the things that we do pleases God and we think of like, and what I'm saying is like attendance uh, to church or those things aren't really the things that please God. What pleases God is when we listen here, utilize the things that we heard in church and then do something with it. And there might be somebody sitting right there beside us that that needs us to be Jesus for them. 
What we're going to close this evening, again, like I said, you know, if you have the Bible study book, it, it goes a lot more in depth with some other things, uh, so you'll have more out of that than what we do. But as we close out, you know, we've got three weeks left in this Gospel Foundation. Next week is the mission embraced, right? So it's, it's now Saul, who is Paul, is going to go... And so once we get done with this, in uh, three more Wednesday nights, we're going to start the gospel-shaped life. We're going to see what the things that we've learned, now what do we get to do with them, right? So that's the exciting thing. Anyway, hey, we love you guys. It's great to be able to share with you. Uh, we always give you an opportunity for uh, to be able to share in ministry with us. Uh, you can do that by giving through the LifeWay by Generosity app. Uh, you can download that onto your phone, PC, or tablet. You can give securely, secretly from your own home. You can track your own giving. Uh, you can uh, give through uh, mailing a check to the church and putting attention to Linda on it. North Baptist Church, Post Office Box 117, Ottawa, Kansas, 66067. Or you can come on a Sunday morning, join us in person, and drop it in the offering plate. We'd love to have you, however it works for you. Again, like I said, um, we don't have as many books this time as we've had in the past. Uh, I'll, I'll get you the names of what books we're going to be doing. Uh, if you're able to get your own book, that would be great. If you need books uh, from us, you, you need to let us know so we can uh, be prepared to make sure that takes place. Uh, we're super excited about what this next uh, Bible study is going to lead to. Uh, our first one was Discipleship Pathway. The second one has been Gospel Foundation. And then now these next is going to be the Gospel Shaped Lives That We Can Live. Man, doesn't get any better than this, right? We are all going to turn from Saul's to Paul's. And we're going to see what God can do in the midst of that. Anyway, we love you guys. Um, I hope to see you at the food pantry tomorrow. I hope you see you at church on Sunday or the food pantry next Tuesday. Uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, we truly enjoy being a part and fellowshipping with you and uh, being a part of who and what you are and what you're doing. If you need something in the meantime, be sure to let us know. Message us. Uh, call us. Text us. Knock on the door. Like I said, with the women's retreat or whatever it is. Uh, don't miss the many opportunities that um, are available to you to, to do and to grow in your relationship with Christ. Uh, whether it's Bible studies on Wednesday nights to uh, Sunday school or church on Sundays, uh, whatever it is, we really encourage you to uh, be a part of those things to to grow. Uh, even to these uh, to these Wednesday uh, to the women's Bible study. Uh, actually, the men are going to start up a book here pretty quick uh, in a couple weeks, and uh, so we want to give you ample opportunities to be able to do that. Anyway, we'll see you next time around. Love you guys. Good night.